The rise and fall of the Aztec Empire, mysterious human sacrifice and final conquest. In the long history of Central America, the rise of the Aztec Empire is undoubtedly one of the most attention-grabbing chapters. From their origins as a nomadic tribe to becoming an empire with formidable military and economic power, the story of the Aztec people is filled with wisdom, faith, and the struggle for power. Initially, the Aztecs were a nomadic people wandering in search of their sacred land. According to legend, their god, the war god Huitzilopochtli, foretold a sign, an eagle perched on a cactus devouring a snake indicating where they should establish their great city. This prophecy eventually became reality on a small island in Lake Texcoco, where they founded Tenochtitlan, which later became the heart of the Aztec Empire. Tenochtitlan was not only the political center of the Aztec Empire, but also its economic and religious heart. With its intricate system of canals and floating farms, the city showcased the Aztecs' tremendous skill in engineering and agriculture. Its existence symbolized the Aztecs' transformation from a nomadic people to the founders of a powerful empire. The social structure of the Aztec Empire was highly complex, including the emperor, nobles, priests, merchants, artisans, peasants, and slaves. Each stratum had its unique responsibilities and way of life, and this division of labor promoted the prosperity and stability of the empire. Economically, in addition to relying on agriculture, particularly the cultivation of maize, beans, and squash, the Aztec Empire also established an extensive trade network, increasing the wealth of the state treasury through taxation and tribute systems. Religious belief was at the core of Aztec culture, deeply influencing their daily lives and imperial policies. The worship of numerous deities, such as the sun god Huitzilopochtli, the rain god Tlaloc, and the earth goddess Kotlikur, demonstrated the Aztecs' respect and fear of natural forces. Among these, human sacrifice rituals were the most eye-catching religious practice, embodying reverence for the gods, as well as a way to maintain social order and cosmic balance. Through a series of cultural, social, and political measures, the Aztec Empire ultimately became an unshakable force, ruling over vast territories and numerous peoples. However, as history shows, even the greatest empires face challenges. The story of the Aztec Empire is one of creation, faith, and ultimately facing fate. In the Aztec Empire, human sacrifice rituals were not only offerings to the deities, but an indispensable part of the entire social structure. These rituals deeply reflected the Aztecs' understanding of the universe's laws of operation, a worldview based on the cycle of blood and life energy. In this belief system, human vitality was seen as key to maintaining world order, especially the movement of the sun. The objects of sacrifice were often important deities, such as the sun god Huitzilopochtli, who needed human sacrifices to maintain their power and ensure the sun rose every day. The sacrifices to the rain god Tlaloc were to ensure the timely arrival of rainwater, securing the growth of crops and thus sustaining the society's livelihood. These rituals usually took place on special days, such as the turning points of the calendar or after a victory in war, to celebrate. Human sacrifice rituals were filled with symbolic meaning and a sense of religious ceremony. Those chosen for sacrifice were typically prisoners of war or specially selected individuals who would undergo a series of preparations before the sacrifice, including purification, prayer, and a final farewell. The ceremony usually took place in full view, with priests at the top of a temple or a special altar, opening the chest of the sacrifice with a stone knife to take out the beating heart and offer it to the deity's image, with subsequent treatment varying depending on the specific deity and ritual. Among these, the sacrifices made to the sun, god Huitzilopochtli, were particularly noteworthy. Historical records indicate that, during a major celebration at the Templo Mayor of Tenochtitlan, thousands of prisoners of war could be sacrificed in one day to seek the protection and power of the sun god. This grand ceremony not only demonstrated the military power of the Aztec Empire, but also deepened the people's devotion to their religious beliefs. For the Aztec people, these rituals were a part of life, 
embodying reverence for the deities and respect for the cosmic order. However, for those who became the offerings, it undoubtedly represented extreme fear and despair. For those witnessing the rituals, it was both a recognition of the divine majesty and a profound experience of the philosophy of the life-death cycle. This practice of maintaining the balance between the gods and humans through human sacrifice, though difficult to understand in modern society, was at the core of the Aztec Empire's culture and religious beliefs at the time. The importance of human sacrifice rituals went beyond the religious domain. They consolidated the power of the ruling class, maintained social stability, and also reflected the Aztecs' deep understanding of the natural world and divinity. In the early 16th century, the arrival of a European explorer marked a turning point in the history of the Aztec Empire. Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conqueror, landed in what is today Mexico in 1519 with a small group of soldiers and sailors. Cortés aimed to discover new lands and riches, but what he triggered was a clash of civilizations. Cortés's first contact with the Aztec Empire was filled with curiosity and misunderstandings. The Aztec Emperor Montezuma II initially believed this foreign white-skinned leader could be the incarnation of their white-skinned war god, Quetzalcoatl, whose return was prophesied. This religious misunderstanding allowed Cortes to exploit, deeply explore, and eventually approach the heart of the Aztecs, Tenochtitlan. The Spanish military technology was unprecedented for the Aztec warriors. Gunpowder weapons, especially cannons and muskets, and horses provided the Spanish army with a significant advantage. The Aztec warriors, though brave and well-trained, were almost powerless against these new types of weapons. The presence of horses caused great psychological shock on the battlefield, as the Aztecs had never seen horses before. This technological gap gave the Spanish a clear upper hand in the conflict with the Aztec Empire. More importantly, Cortes displayed great political wisdom by exploiting the internal contradictions within the Aztec Empire and with neighboring ethnic groups. He cleverly allied with those indigenous groups oppressed by Aztec rule or desiring independence, especially the alliance with Tlaxcala and other city-states. These alliances not only provided him with valuable ground support, but also significantly strengthened his military force. This strategy allowed Cortes to effectively divide and conquer, deepening existing fractures leading to turmoil and instability within the Aztec Empire. The arrival and subsequent actions of Hernán Cortés posed a fatal challenge to the Aztec Empire. He used his advantages in military technology, tactical strategy, and political manipulation to disrupt the balance of a mighty civilization. The ordeal of the Aztec Empire was not just the extinction of a civilization. It was a complex story of conflict, adaptation, and survival reminding us to reflect deeply on cultural exchange and human history development. As the Spanish conqueror's footsteps approached, the fate of the Aztec Empire reached a critical crossroads. Hernán Cortés and his army, by uniting with the indigenous groups discontent with Aztec rule, launched a decisive attack on Tenochtitlan. This siege was not only a military conflict, but also a collision of cultures and beliefs. In 1521, the Spanish army and its allies besieged Tenochtitlan, initiating a months-long siege. The Spanish strategy was to block the city's waterways, cutting off the Aztecs' food and water supply. Meanwhile, they used the advantage of gunpowder weapons to bombard the city continuously. The Spanish also employed small boats to combat the Aztecs' canoes on Lake Texcoco, further weakening the Aztec defenses. The Aztecs showed remarkable resistance during the siege, they built defensive fortifications and used the city's waterways and bridges for tactical retreats and counterattacks. Aztec warriors fought desperately in the streets against the Spanish, displaying their unwavering will to defend their homeland. However, facing the Spanish military technology and tactical superiority, along with internal diseases and hunger, the Aztec resistance gradually became powerless. The fall of Tenochtitlan into Spanish hands marked the end of the Aztec Empire. The Spanish systematically destroyed this magnificent city, including its splendid temples and palaces, leveling most of its structures to the ground. This catastrophe had a profound impact on the Aztec people, with thousands dying from combat, hunger, and disease. 
The destruction of Tenochtitlan was not only a material loss, but also a huge blow to the culture and spirit. The ultimate failure of the Aztec people was not only due to the military superiority of the Spanish, but also because of internal divisions and the betrayal of external allies. Cortes was able to cleverly exploit the empire's internal contradictions and dissatisfaction, drawing the surrounding nations into a force against the Aztecs. Additionally, the Aztec Empire was unable to effectively respond to diseases brought by the Spanish, such as smallpox, which rapidly spread among the indigenous people without natural immunity, causing a massive loss of population. The siege of Tenochtitlan and the fall of the Aztec Empire marked the end of an era and the beginning of a new era of colonial rule and cultural blending. This history not only shows the cruelty of conflict and conquest, but also witnesses the power of human resilience and adaptability. With the decline of the Aztec Empire, a once powerful civilization was forced to accept new rulers and culture. However, despite facing significant challenges and changes, the legacy of the Aztec civilization has survived in various forms, having a profound impact on the culture, religion, and social structure of modern Mexico. The fall of the Aztec Empire brought significant changes to local culture and religion. The Spanish conquerors tried to erase Aztec religious beliefs, introducing Christianity as the dominant religion. However, Aztec beliefs and rituals did not completely disappear, but instead blended with Christian elements, forming unique religious practices. In terms of social structure, although the Spanish established a new ruling class, the original Aztec social classes and their skills and knowledge were preserved to some extent and integrated into the new social system. The contribution of Aztec civilization to modern Mexican identity is immeasurable. First in language, many Nahuatl words have been integrated into Mexican Spanish, becoming part of everyday life. In art, Aztec patterns and symbols are widely used by modern Mexican artists, becoming important elements in expressing national and cultural identity. Festivals and celebrations, such as the Day of the Dead, although originating from Aztec tradition, have become cultural events celebrated nationally and even globally, reflecting respect for ancestors and celebration of life. Modern reflection on this history has inspired a complex evaluation of human sacrifice rituals and the consequences of conquest. Human sacrifice rituals, although difficult to fully understand or accept from a contemporary perspective, were an important part of Aztec belief and cosmology. They remind us to examine different cultures' views on life, death, and the universe. Meanwhile, the Spanish conquest and the destruction of the Aztec civilization have sparked discussions on cultural extinction and assimilation, prompting people to think about how to respect and preserve diversity while understanding and commemorating the past. The story of the Aztec Empire is one of creation, prosperity, disaster, and legacy. It teaches us that even in the shadow of extinction and conquest, culture and identity can survive and evolve in new forms. The legacy of the Aztecs is not just a part of Mexican history, but a cultural treasure for all humanity, worthy of our learning, understanding, and cherishing. The Golden Age of Piracy, a double stage of freedom and fear. At the turn of the 17th and 18th centuries, the Caribbean region was not only a vast expanse of blue on the world map, but also a place of political and economic turmoil on the international stage. During this period, as European navigators traversed the unknown oceans, the wealth of the New World began to flow continuously to the Old World. Spain, England, France, the Netherlands, and other countries engaged in fierce competition in this vast maritime area for the newly discovered lands and valuable resources gold, silver, sugar, spices, and other precious commodities. In this context, the Caribbean Sea became the core of global trade routes, especially the famous Silver Ship Route, which connected the mineral resources of the New World with the markets of Europe. However, these valuable goods and busy sea routes attracted not only merchants and explorers, but also pirates who hoped to get rich quickly through plunder. Therefore, the Caribbean region of the 17th and 18th centuries became the golden age of piracy. During this period, pirates were not only numerous but also bold in their actions. 
their activities ranged widely and even formed a unique transnational maritime plundering culture. Pirates seized the strategic importance of the Caribbean Sea, located at the intersection of North America, South America, and Europe. It was a crucial trade route connecting the New World and the Old World. They used this geographical advantage to set ambushes on these trade routes, attacking passing merchant ships, and even engaging in direct confrontations with naval forces of various countries. The Golden Age of Piracy came about not only because of the geopolitical landscape at the time, but also due to the opportunities it presented to pirates. Competition and conflicts among European powers often led them to turn a blind eye or even secretly support pirate attacks against enemy countries in order to weaken their economic strength and maritime dominance. Pirates, to some extent, became pawns in this global power game while also benefiting from it. Furthermore, the numerous islands and intricate coastlines of the Caribbean provided pirates with numerous hidden bases and shelters. These geographical conditions allowed pirates to easily conceal themselves, evade pursuit, and launch rapid attacks, dealing deadly blows to their enemies. During the golden age of piracy, no pirate was able to inspire people's imagination and fear quite like Edward Teach, better known as the notorious Blackbeard. The name and image of Blackbeard have become synonymous with pirate legends, but there are few definite records about his origin and early life, shrouding the life of this pirate captain in mystery. It is said that Edward Teach was born around 1680, possibly in England or Wales. However, like many pirate tales, there are scarce records of his early life, leaving blanks that later generations have filled with rich imagination. It wasn't until he appeared in historical records as an adult man that he joined the ranks of pirates. Blackbeard's fame spread not only because of his numerous battles and plundering at sea, but also because of his unique and terrifying image. Teach had a formidable appearance. It is said he was tall and muscular, with a thick black beard into which he often braided burning fuses during battles, making him appear like a demon from hell in the eyes of his enemies. Formidable and awe-inspiring, this deliberately crafted image not only instilled fear in his enemies, but also made his name prominent among pirates. The exact time Blackbeard joined the pirate life is unclear, but he quickly rose from an ordinary sailor to a notorious pirate captain. In 1716, Teach joined the crew of the renowned pirate Benjamin Hornigold and quickly demonstrated extraordinary navigation and leadership skills. Shortly after, he acquired his own ship, Queen Anne's Revenge, and began his maritime reign. Blackbeard's reputation was not only forged by his terrifying appearance and ruthless combat style, but also by his cunning intelligence and adept tactical use at sea. Although his pirate career lasted only a few years, during this time, he successfully attacked numerous ships, dominating the Caribbean and the eastern coast of the Americas, becoming the most dreaded presence at sea. In pirate history, Blackbeard's maritime reign is legendary. His name was synonymous with terror, and his flagship, Queen Anne's Revenge, was a notorious symbol. Through a series of major battles and plundering, Blackbeard proved himself as the uncrowned king of the sea. Queen Anne's Revenge was originally a French slave ship captured and refitted into a pirate ship by Blackbeard in 1717. This flagship was equipped with 40 cannons, powerful enough to have overwhelming superiority in any naval battle at the time. Blackbeard transformed it into a true warship, making it the most feared presence in the Caribbean and even the entire Atlantic Ocean. Under Blackbeard's command, Queen Anne's Revenge participated in countless attacks on merchant ships and colonies. One of the most famous was the blockade of Charleston Harbor in 1718. Blackbeard successfully blockaded this major port in South Carolina, capturing several ships and demanding a huge ransom from local residents. This operation not only demonstrated Blackbeard's astonishing courage, but also showcased his ingenious navigation and tactical skills. Blackbeard's domination of the seas was achieved through a combination of cunning terror strategies and navigational skills. He often used his image and the firepower of his flagship to instill fear in opponents before real combat began. By inserting burning fuses into his beard, he created a ghostly image during battles, 
causing the enemy to lose their will to fight in fear. In addition, his profound understanding of sea routes and precise grasp of wind and weather changes enabled him to easily capture merchant ships and cleverly evade pursuit by the Royal Navy. Blackbeard's maritime reign was not only built on his cruelty and intimidation, but also on his leadership as a captain and mastery of maritime combat arts. He was able to fight in harsh ocean environments, accurately utilizing ships and weapons, proving himself not only an outstanding pirate, but also an excellent navigator and strategist. In the depths of the oceans during the golden age of piracy, the lives and culture of pirates formed a unique and complex world. Far from the constraints of land and the sanctions of the law, pirates established a unique social order on their ships, which in many ways defied the expectations of mainstream society at the time. An unexpected democratic system prevailed on pirate ships. Crew members had the right to vote on important matters, including the election of the captain and other senior positions. This system ensured that everyone's voice could be heard and reflected the pirates' pursuit of equality. Additionally, pirates followed a set of rules known as the Pirate Code, which detailed principles of sharing loot, behavior during battles and punishment for traitors, among other things. Though this code was brutal, it ensured order and discipline on pirate ships, enabling pirates to effectively cooperate and carry out complex maritime plundering operations. Despite the emphasis on equality in pirate society, there still existed a certain hierarchy. Captains and officers held decision-making power, but their authority was not absolute. It was based on the support of the crew. Most notably, pirates distributed booty fairly. According to the Pirate Code, loot was distributed among the crew according to predetermined ratios, with captains and officers receiving slightly more. This distribution method fostered team spirit and reflected the pirates' emphasis on fairness and equality. The image of pirates is deeply rooted in today's popular culture, from movies and TV shows to books and festival celebrations. The pirate image is everywhere. However, the pirates depicted in popular culture are often romanticized or exaggerated. Pirates in modern popular culture are frequently portrayed as anti-heroes seeking freedom and adventure, their lives filled with excitement and recklessness. While these elements are indeed part of pirate life, the reality of pirate life is far more complex and harsh. Pirates often faced great dangers, including conflicts with naval forces from various countries, diseases, hunger, and betrayal. Though their society had elements of democracy and equality, it was also cruel and merciless. On a cold morning in 1718, one of the most famous captains of the golden age of piracy, Edward Teach, known as Blackbeard, met his demise. On this day, in the Ocracoke Inlet of North Carolina, Blackbeard engaged in his final battle with a small fleet of British naval ships. Commanding the decisive battle was Lieutenant Robert Maynard of the British Navy, who led two small boats carrying soldiers, determined to put an end to Blackbeard's maritime reign. The battle was exceptionally fierce, with neither side showing mercy. Legend has it that Blackbeard displayed astonishing courage and strength in battle, wielding his sword against the enemy until the very end. Ultimately, this infamous pirate captain fell. His head hung on Maynard's ship as a symbol of the end of his pirate career and a warning to other pirates. Blackbeard's death marked the end of an era. Though piracy continued for some time after his death, no pirate left such a profound impression on the public as Blackbeard did. His death added to the mystery of his legend, and his name and image became symbols of pirate infamy. In the eyes of many, Blackbeard epitomized the pinnacle of the pirate world. Fearless, cruel, cunning, yet also charismatic and mysterious, even in death, Blackbeard's legacy remains profound. His story has inspired countless books, movies, TV shows, and folklore, becoming an enduring theme in pirate tales. The popularity of the Blackbeard image reflects people's fascination with pirate life and their longing for freedom and adventure. At the same time, his story reminds us that although the golden age of piracy may be distant and mysterious, it did indeed exist, representing a bloody but legendary period in human history. Furthermore, 
Blackbeard and his colleagues had a profound impact on the history of the Caribbean region. They not only influenced the development of maritime trade and navigation technology, but also prompted major colonial powers to strengthen their control and management of maritime territories. These direct or indirect effects influenced the political and economic development of the region in later years. The end of the pirate era did not come from sudden changes in fortune, but rather from profound political and economic changes. In the late 17th and 18th centuries, as major European colonial powers gradually strengthened their control over the Caribbean region, and as maritime trade became more regulated and military forces grew stronger, piracy gradually came under severe suppression. Political changes led to the suppression of piracy. Governments realized that piracy posed a serious threat to national interests and took measures to intensify anti-piracy efforts, including increasing naval forces, signing anti-piracy agreements, and strengthening control over colonies. Additionally, some countries offered policies such as amnesty and rewards to encourage pirates to voluntarily abandon their criminal activities. Economic changes also affected the end of the pirate era. As European countries established more stable colonies and trading posts in the Caribbean region, and as maritime trade became more regulated, the threat of piracy to trade routes gradually diminished. Meanwhile, with the rise of the Industrial Revolution, European countries began to gradually reduce their dependence on overseas trade, further weakening the economic foundation of piracy. The end of the pirate era brings us profound reflections on power, freedom, and rebellion. The age of piracy illustrates the eternal struggle between power and freedom. Pirates, existing on the political and social margins, sought to escape authority's control through rebellion and freedom, pursuing personal liberty and independence. However, their ultimate fate of failure also warns us that there exists a subtle and complex relationship between power and freedom. To achieve true freedom, one must operate within the framework of law and morality. The pirate era teaches us the importance of resisting injustice and pursuing freedom. Pirates represented the lower echelons of society, attempting to change the oppressed and exploited status quo through rebellion and resistance. While their methods may not have been entirely justifiable, their spirit and determination are worthy of admiration. Pirate stories inspire us to bravely stand up for our rights and dignity, fearlessly and steadfastly. The end of the pirate era is not merely a historical event, but also a profound reflection on human values and morals. We can draw lessons from it, better understanding the relationship between power and freedom and how to resist injustice and pursue true freedom and dignity through legitimate means. In the history of piracy, we discover a unique duality. They were both criminals and symbols of freedom. While pirate activities were considered criminal, to some extent, they also represented a spirit of resistance and freedom. Pirates were often marginalized by society, seeking freedom and independence through maritime adventures and struggles, breaking free from societal constraints and oppression. Because of this, pirates are often seen as symbols of freedom and adventure, their image romanticized and heroized in popular culture. In particular, the pirate leader Blackbeard's story epitomizes this duality. As a pirate captain, Blackbeard plundered and killed recklessly, seen as a villain and tyrant. However, his image is also praised for his spirit of resistance and resilience. His story encompasses both brutality and violence, as well as courage and freedom. This contradictory duality makes the pirate image more rounded and complex, leading to conflicting views. Audiences should consider how anti-hero figures in history influence our views of justice and morality. Pirates and figures like Blackbeard, though historically seen as criminals and thugs, have sparked contemplation on freedom and justice. Their images have been repeatedly depicted in literature, art, and popular culture, prompting discussions on rebellion and free will. Therefore, we should examine the stories of these anti-hero figures, reflecting on their morals and values, in order to better understand the complexity of human history and social progress. The Battle of Jerusalem the greatest showdown in history. At the end of the 11th century, the destinies of Europe and the Middle East were intertwined. 
a period that witnessed a series of unprecedented military expeditions, namely the Crusades. The spark of this conflict originated in 1095, when Pope Urban II, at the Council of Clermont, issued a call aiming to ask the Knights of Western Europe to go to the Holy Land to reclaim Jerusalem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the most sacred place of Christianity, from the hands of the Muslims. This call was not only for religious reasons, but also reflected the political and social needs within Europe, including the search for external enemies to reduce internal conflicts and to find land and wealth for the surplus knight class. Over the next 200 years, several crusades erupted between the East and the West, deeply changing the course of history in the Middle East and Europe. Among the many figures, Richard the Lionheart and Saladin stood out, becoming the most celebrated heroes of the Crusades. Richard I, also known as the Lionheart, was born in 1157, the son of King Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine. His heroic spirit and military talent were evident when he was still a young noble. Richard's life was full of legends. He was both a ruthless warrior and an idealistic monarch, deeply influenced by the knightly spirit and Christian savior concept popular at the time. When he ascended to the throne in 1189, he immediately turned his attention to the Holy Land, hoping to prove his strength and devotion by conquering Jerusalem. On the opposite side was Saladin, an equally formidable opponent. Saladin, full name Salah ad-Din Yusuf, was born in 1137, a Kurdish Muslim general and politician. Through wisdom and military talent, Saladin unified the fragmented factions of the Muslim world, becoming the founder and first sultan of the Ayyubid dynasty. He was not only an outstanding military leader, but also a ruler known for his mercy and justice. For Saladin, resisting the Crusader invasion and defending Jerusalem was not only a religious duty, but also necessary to maintain his kingdom and people. When Richard I ascended to the throne of England, he was already filled with a strong passion for the expedition to the Holy Land. His decision to participate in the Third Crusade was not driven by a single motive, but by a combination of factors. Firstly, as a devout Christian, Richard firmly believed that it was his duty to protect the Holy Land and ensure that Christians could safely make pilgrimages. For him, reclaiming Jerusalem was not only a religious obligation, but also the ultimate proof of faith. Secondly, politically, Richard hoped to enhance his international status by participating in the Crusade. In Europe at the time, taking part in the Crusade was seen as a noble act, one that could elevate a monarch's prestige and influence. Lastly, personal glory was also one of the important motivations for Richard to go to war. As a valiant warrior, Richard was eager to demonstrate his bravery and leadership abilities on the battlefield and win eternal glory. Richard's crusade journey was filled with dramatic conflicts and splendid victories, among which the Battle of Acre was the best display of his military talent. In 1191, Richard led the crusaders in laying siege to the city of Acre. The geographical location of this city was crucial for controlling the road to Jerusalem. Despite facing harsh conditions and strong defenses, Richard showed his extraordinary ability as a military commander. He not only reorganized the Crusaders' attack teams, but also introduced new siege tactics, such as using siege towers and crossbows. After a siege lasting two months, Richard successfully captured the city of Acre, opening the road to Jerusalem for the Crusaders. Richard's military strategy was not just manifested in direct combat. He was well aware of the importance of diplomacy in war, negotiating with Saladin multiple times, trying to resolve the conflict through diplomatic means. Although these negotiations did not bring about ultimate peace, they showcased the multifaceted nature of Richard as a king and military leader. Against the backdrop of the Crusades, the Muslim world faced serious issues of division and internal strife. It was Saladin, this great leader, with his outstanding political and military skills, who successfully united the Muslim camp to resist the crusade invasion. Saladin first used diplomatic means to cleverly quell the disputes between different Muslim factions, emphasizing the importance of unity in the face of a common enemy. Under his leadership, it was not just a military alliance, but also a unification of thoughts and beliefs. 
Saladin knew that only by uniting all Muslims could they effectively resist the Crusades' assault. To counter the Crusades, Saladin adopted a series of strategic and preparatory measures. He reorganized his army, introduced new training methods, and ensured that his forces could move quickly to respond to the Crusaders' flexible tactics. At the same time, Saladin also strengthened the city's defenses and stored a large amount of food and military supplies, fully preparing for the upcoming war. The confrontation between Saladin and Richard the Lionheart, especially in the Battle of Hatton, showcased the contest between two military geniuses. The Battle of Hatton in 1177, not only a turning point in the Crusades, but also a paragon of Saladin's military prowess. In this battle, Saladin skillfully utilized the terrain and tactics to lure the Crusaders into the wilderness to fight under conditions of scarce water sources, ultimately achieving a crushing victory. The Battle of Hatton not only severely damaged the Crusaders, but also paved the way for Saladin's subsequent recapture of Jerusalem. In subsequent confrontations with Richard, Saladin displayed his flexible and varied tactics. Faced with Richard's military talent, Saladin adopted a strategy of avoiding the solid and striking the void, avoiding head-on clashes, and instead, through guerrilla tactics and the powerful Muslim cavalry, continuously harassed and depleted the Crusader forces. This strategy, to a certain extent, offset the Crusaders' advantage in weapons and equipment, leading the war into a stalemate phase. Jerusalem, this ancient city, is not only a holy place for the three major monotheistic religions, but also the focus of countless conflicts in history. In the narrative of the Crusades, Jerusalem is not just a geographical location, it symbolizes faith, glory, and ultimate victory. For Christians, Jerusalem is the place of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, possessing unparalleled religious significance. The existence of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre makes this city the ultimate destination for pilgrimage. For the Crusaders, reclaiming Jerusalem was not only the fulfillment of a religious mission, but also a demonstration of the unity and strength of the Christian world. Similarly, Jerusalem holds profound religious significance for Muslims as well. It is the location where the Prophet Muhammad ascended to heaven during the night journey, and the Dome of the Rock Mosque within it is the third holiest site in Islam. Therefore, protecting Jerusalem from foreign invasion is both a religious duty for Saladin and the Muslim world and a symbol of the defense of the Islamic faith. This religious and cultural significance from both sides made Jerusalem the central focus of the Crusades, the core of the conflict between the two sides. After a long period of military campaigning, Richard's forces finally launched their last attack on Jerusalem in 1191. However, faced with the impregnable city defenses and Saladin's strong defense, along with the Crusader army's internal divisions and resource depletion, Richard ultimately failed to capture Jerusalem. After a long period of deadlock and attrition, Richard and Saladin began to seek conflict resolution through negotiation. In 1192, the two sides reached a historically significant agreement, the Treaty of Jaffa. According to this treaty, Jerusalem remained in Muslim hands, but Christian pilgrims were allowed to enter the city unarmed for pilgrimage. Moreover, the Crusaders retained some key coastal cities, ensuring the presence of Christian forces in the Holy Land. This agreement reflected both sides' respect for religious beliefs and their desire for peace. Although it did not fully achieve the initial goals of either side, the Treaty of Jaffa ended the prolonged conflict and laid the foundation for subsequent relative peace. In the struggle for Jerusalem, we saw the power of faith and the tragedy of conflict. The history of sieges and negotiations not only displayed military strategies and diplomatic wisdom, but also profoundly revealed humanity's eternal pursuit of peace and coexistence. This historical lesson still has a profound impact on the world today. The signing of the Treaty of Jaffa showcased the strategic intelligence and common pursuit of peace between Richard and Saladin. The main contents of the agreement included, Jerusalem would continue to remain in Muslim hands, but Christian pilgrims would be allowed to enter the city unarmed for pilgrimage. The Crusaders would retain several important cities and fortresses along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, 
ensuring a certain presence of Christian forces in the Holy Land. Both parties agreed to a three-year truce, bringing a temporary peace and opportunity for recovery to the people and land ravaged by war. Although the agreement did not fully meet the initial desires of both parties under the historical context of that time, it was a compromise acceptable to both sides, opening new possibilities for the relations between East and West. With the signing of the Treaty of Jaffa, the stories of Richard and Saladin did not end but left a deep imprint in the memory of history. Their legacy is not just a symbol of courage and wisdom, but also a model for seeking peace and understanding in conflict. This legacy still has a profound impact on the world today. Richard and Saladin, as two military and political leaders, exhibited distinctly different leadership styles. Richard was known for his impulsive, brave and direct tactics. His leadership style was full of passion and drive, capable of inspiring soldiers to exhibit utmost courage and strength on the battlefield. However, this style sometimes led to impulsive decisions, affecting the implementation of long-term strategies. In contrast, Saladin's leadership was more focused on strategy and diplomacy. His military actions were well considered, and his strategies were flexible, able to adjust quickly according to battlefield situations. His tolerance and respect for enemies won him respect from both friends and foes. This leadership style was effective not only on the battlefield, but also laid the foundations for his success in political and cultural fields. The Crusades were a significant event in the history of the East and West, deepening the divide between the Christian and Islamic worlds, but also initiating the exchange of culture and knowledge. The long-term impact of this conflict is reflected in the perception of the two leaders in later generations. Richard is seen as a heroic king in the West, symbolizing the knightly spirit and military valor, while Saladin is celebrated as a just leader and great liberator in the East, especially in the Islamic world. The Crusades also revealed deep misunderstandings and prejudices between different cultures, but also showed the possibility of achieving a certain degree of understanding and respect through exchange and learning. Saladin's tolerant policy towards Christian pilgrims was not only a manifestation of political wisdom, but also a demonstration of the profound value of religious tolerance. In an era of frequent wars and conflicts, Saladin's policy was a fresh stream, showing that even in the most tense oppositions, people could still choose understanding, respect, and tolerance. Saladin's tolerance did not mean giving up faith or principles, but displayed a high level of wisdom in transcending hostility and seeking coexistence. This lesson still has profound significance in today's world, reminding us that even in the face of deep differences and conflicts, tolerance, respect, and dialogue remain the cornerstone of building peace and coexistence. Fire and clouds, the evil beast of the West and the auspiciousness of the East, what role does the dragon play in culture? On a casual afternoon, I sat in the old study, sunlight streaming through partially drawn curtains onto dusty bookshelves. In my hand was a yellowed compendium of mythological creatures. As I casually flipped through its pages, two illustrations caught my attention. In the first, a Chinese dragon danced amidst swirling clouds, its slender body shimmering with iridescent scales its whiskers flowing as if freely navigating the skies. In stark contrast, the second illustration depicted a western dragon, its massive body covered in rough scales, powerful wings, spewing flames from its gaping maw, with surrounding rocks seemingly melting from its intense heat. These two markedly different creatures, one akin to a serpent in the sky, the other resembling a beast from hell plunged me into contemplation. Why are these two vastly distinct beings both referred to as dragons? It was not merely a linguistic coincidence, but a puzzle interwoven with culture and history. This train of thought seemed to open a gateway to exploring ancient legends and cultural disparities, leading me on a mysterious journey spanning East and West, delving deeper into the history and cultural significance of the enigmatic creature, the dragon. I became intensely interested in etymology which not only helped me grasp the differences of dragon across cultures, 
but also unveiled how language traverses cultures. The Chinese term long, long, originates from ancient Chinese, initially denoting a mythical creature capable of bringing rain and good fortune, symbolizing power and nobility, closely tied to ancient Chinese explanations and worship of natural phenomena. In contrast, the English term dragon traces back to more distant Western languages, derived from the Latin draco, which in turn stems from the Greek dracon, dracon, meaning serpent or guardian. In Greek mythology, dragons were often powerful beings guarding treasures or sacred places, their image sharply contrasting with the elegance and benevolence of Chinese dragons. Even more intriguingly, these two terms, Long Ma Long and Dragon, may have undergone processes of mutual influence in history. With the opening of trade routes like the Silk Road, cultural exchanges between East and West became increasingly frequent. The Eastern Long Mai Long and the Western Dragon might have undergone semantic and cultural amalgamation during this process, gradually leading dragon to be used to refer to Eastern dragons, becoming a cross-cultural symbol. This intersection of language and culture not only enriched the connotations of the dragon image, but also showcased the significant role of cultural exchange in human history. In Western mythology, the image of the dragon differs vastly from the East. Western dragons are typically depicted as winged creatures capable of breathing fire. These dragons are massive, with skin covered in tough scales, their gaze emanating fierceness and malice. They often guard over treasures of gold and silver in deep forests or remote caves, launching deadly attacks on any brave warriors or adventurers who dare to approach. In Western culture, dragons symbolize evil and greed. They represent the immense challenges that humans must face and overcome on their moral journey. These beasts often play the role of adversaries in stories, inspiring heroes to display courage and wisdom to defeat the forces of evil. Among them, the story of St. George and the Dragon is a typical example, widely spread throughout Western culture. St. George is a Christian saint, and the most famous part of his story describes how he rode a horse and used a spear to defeat a terrifying dragon. This dragon threatened a small town, even demanding the residents sacrifice their children to satisfy its hunger. St. George's arrival not only confronted this embodiment of evil, but also with his courage and divine assistance, successfully defeated it, symbolizing the eternal theme of light overcoming darkness and justice triumphing over evil. This tale is not only a hymn to courage and justice, but also deeply reflects the cultural symbol of dragons as an evil force to be overcome in Western culture. Through such narratives, the Western dragon establishes a threatening and challenging image in cultural psychology inspiring people to face difficulties with resilience and determination. The image of the Chinese dragon is starkly different from the Western dragon. It typically appears as a long serpent, with a body covered in magnificent scales, adorned with long whiskers and horns moving with graceful fluidity, often soaring through clouds. This dragon not only has the ability to control the weather, especially rainfall, but is also believed to be the spirit that regulates rivers and lakes, ensuring bountiful harvests and harmonious lives for people. In Chinese culture, the dragon is a symbol of auspiciousness, representing great wisdom and power. The image of the dragon is widely used in various cultural practices and artistic works, demonstrating its profound influence on Chinese culture. Furthermore, the dragon also symbolizes the connection between harmony and the heavens and earth, reflecting people's awe and understanding of natural phenomena. In Chinese history, emperors were often referred to as true dragon sons of heaven, not only indicating the emperor's supreme political position, but also implying a certain divine quality and legitimacy of rule. This title stems from the reverence and symbolic significance of the dragon, believed to possess the power and wisdom to protect and govern the country. The emperor's dragon robes, dragon beds, and even dragon thrones are adorned with dragon patterns to showcase their majesty and power. During Chinese New Year and other important festivals, dragon dances are important traditional activities, serving not only as a celebration, but also as a way to pray for auspiciousness, happiness, and prosperity.
Giant dragon lanterns or dragon dance performances parade through the streets during festivals, attracting the gaze of numerous spectators, expressing hopes for good luck and smooth sailing in the coming year. Through these cultural practices and historical legends, the Chinese dragon demonstrates its important position and profound cultural significance in Chinese culture, not just as a mythical creature, but also as a symbol of the spirit and cultural identity of the Chinese nation. Cultural differences profoundly shape the differing views and representations of dragons in the East and West. In the West, religious doctrine often associates dragons with demons, symbolizing the sins and trials humanity must overcome. Western dragons often appear as antagonistic forces, described as evil entities in many biblical stories and legends. This viewpoint reflects the Western cultural cognition of absolute good and evil, as well as the steadfastness of moral and faith through overcoming evil. In contrast, particularly in Chinese culture, the dragon symbolizes wisdom and power, intricately linked to the harmony of the universe. In Taoist and folk tales, dragons control the weather and bodies of water, serving as auspicious omens of prosperity. This image reflects the Eastern philosophical concept of balance and harmony, the idea of unity between heaven and humanity. The dragon, as a bridge between the natural world and humanity, embodies a profound cosmic order. Although the symbolic significance of dragons in Eastern and Western cultures differs significantly, dragons hold important positions in both cultures, symbolizing power and supernatural abilities. In the West, Dragons symbolize challenges faced by humans, representing the courage and strength needed to overcome evil forces. In the East, especially in China, dragons symbolize vitality and cosmic wisdom, serving as guardians of the nation and people. This cross-cultural comparison not only reveals worldviews and values under different cultural backgrounds, but also emphasizes the universality and diversity of dragons as a global symbol in different cultural traditions. Whether as a symbol of challenge or as an auspicious omen, dragons play significant roles in human cultural psychology and mythological stories, showcasing their universal symbolism of power and mystery across global cultures. Personally, I believe that although Western dragons and Chinese dragons exhibit significant differences in form and symbolism, their unified classification as dragons is itself a manifestation of humanity's collective imagination. This not only demonstrates our universal awe of supernatural forces, but also reflects a shared exploration of mystery and the unknown among different cultures. Western dragons, typically symbols of evil forces, represent the challenges and trials that humans must overcome. They play the role of adversaries in stories, inspiring heroes to display extraordinary courage and determination. These stories not only provide entertainment and education within cultural traditions, but also deepen people's understanding of morals and values. In contrast, the image of the Chinese dragon is closely associated with harmony, wisdom, and power, often appearing as protectors, even being linked to symbols of imperial authority in ancient times. The image of the Chinese dragon pervades festivals, arts, and literature, becoming a symbol of auspiciousness and prosperity. This positive view of dragons reflects a philosophical approach to harmonious coexistence with nature, emphasizing harmony between humans and the environment. Therefore, although dragons in both cultures differ in appearance and connotation, they express the need for human interpretation of the environment and the desire to convey cultural values through mythical stories. These stories not only enhance cohesion within communities, but also serve as cultural exports, fostering understanding and communication between different cultures. Through such comparisons, we can more profoundly understand that regardless of cultural backgrounds, humans always maintain a shared reverence and curiosity for forces beyond nature. That afternoon, filled with the scent of books and historical ambiance, as I discovered those two vivid portraits of dragons amidst the old stacks of books, a profound realization gradually formed in my mind. Whether depicted as fierce beasts in the West or sacred guardians in the East, they are not merely mythological creatures within their respective cultures. 
the image of the dragon transcends the boundaries of singular cultures, becoming a global cultural symbol that promotes cross-cultural communication and understanding. These mysterious creatures reveal the differences between cultures while also unveiling humanity's shared imagination and desire to explore the unknown. As a cultural symbol, dragons are not only protagonists of stories and myths, but also a part of humanity's collective cultural heritage. Though the roles they play vary across different cultures, these roles reflect deep-seated human values of power, wisdom, and morality. Therefore, dragons are not just creatures in mythology. They are also bridges for cross-cultural exchange and understanding. Through comparative research into the diverse cultural representations of dragons, we can gain a deeper understanding and appreciation of these differences, while also cherishing our common cultural connections and historical ties. This deep cultural exploration not only enriches my knowledge perspective, but also enhances my respect and understanding for different cultural traditions. From ancient rituals to modern practices, shamanism's profound connection to the natural world. In our world, there exists an ancient and mysterious belief system that transcends the boundaries of time and geography, connecting humanity with the natural world and the material realm with the spiritual domain. This is shamanism, a form of spiritual practice rooted in several ancient cultures across the globe. The origins of shamanism can be traced back to thousands of years ago, initially emerging in what is today the Siberian Plateau. However, over time, it has spread across the world, from the cold forests of North America to the tropical rainforests of South America and to the vast plains of Asia, demonstrating remarkable adaptability and diversity. In shamanism, the shaman acts as a bridge between the human world and the spiritual realm. They are not only healers and conductors of rituals, but also guides and sages of the community. By entering into profound trance states, Shamans can communicate with the spiritual world, bringing healing, guidance, and protection to the human community. But shamanism is more than this. It represents a way of life, a profound understanding of the natural world and our role within it. Shamanism teaches respect for all forms of life, understanding the profound impact of human actions on the natural world, and seeking ways to live in harmony with nature. In the following video, we will delve into the rich belief system and mystical rituals of shamanism. We will discover how, despite its roots in ancient traditions and cultures, it remains vibrant and relevant in the modern world. We will explore how shamanism influences the relationship between its followers and the natural world and its significance and role in today's world. Through understanding shamanism, we not only gain insight into an ancient belief system, but also reflect on our own relationship with nature and how we can find our spiritual refuge and balance in this rapidly changing era. In the early history of humanity, when ancient cultures were still forming, shamanism had already taken root in the vast snowfields and deep forests of Siberia. This belief system, initially practiced by the hunter-gatherer societies of Siberia, saw shamans as their spiritual leaders and healers. There, shamanism was not just a belief, it was part of survival, guiding people to coexist harmoniously with nature and interpreting dreams and omens. Over time, shamanism flowed like water into other regions and cultures. Its presence crossed the frozen Bering Strait to reach the North American continent, then spread southward to the tropical rainforests of South America. At each location, shamanism merged with the local beliefs and traditions, creating unique practices. In North America, shamans became visual artists and storytellers within Indian tribes, while in South America, they became healers and priests, communicating with the spiritual world through the use of plants and medicines. Despite its diversity in different regions, shamanism shares a core concept, the shaman as a bridge between the material world and the spiritual realm, whether in the cold steppes of Siberia or the hot jungles of the Amazon, shamans fulfill this role, entering trance states through rituals, singing, dancing, and drumming to communicate with the spiritual world. Moreover, the practices and beliefs of shamanism have been brought to other corners of the world, such as Mongolia, Tuva, 
and certain regions in Africa and Asia. In these places, shamanism has blended with local traditions to create new forms of rituals and beliefs. However, its core spirit, respect for nature and seeking wisdom and guidance from the spiritual realm, remains unchanged. At the heart of shamanism beats an endless awe and respect for the natural world. It is not only a belief, but a way of interacting with the world. Shamanism teaches us that every leaf, every drop of water, every gust of wind, and even every grain of dust is filled with life and spirit. This profound understanding of nature prompts shamans and their followers to live in a state of humility and harmony, always aware that humans are but one of the many forms of life in the natural world. Shamans, these priests and spiritual mentors of shamanism, are seen as bridges between the human world and the spiritual realm. They possess unique abilities to cross the boundaries between the material and non-material, entering a broader universal consciousness. In this process, shamans use their knowledge, intuition, and special skills to provide healing, protection, and guidance for the community. Shamans communicate with the spiritual world in various ways, with rituals being one of the core practices. These rituals might involve the use of drums, singing, dancing, and other ritualistic items to help the shaman reach a trance state, thereby communicating with the inhabitants of the spiritual world. In this state, shamans can seek guidance from spirits, find healing for illnesses, or offer prophecies for the community. In addition to rituals, shamans also communicate with the spiritual world through dreams and journeys. In dreams, shamans may receive messages from ancestors or spiritual mentors, offering keys to solving problems. Journeys, on the other hand, are spiritual travels, where shamans leave their bodies to directly enter the spiritual world, engaging in direct dialogue and interaction with its entities. These unique practices not only highlight the deep connection between shamans and the spiritual world, but also reflect their important responsibility in maintaining the balance of the community and the natural world. Through these spiritual practices, shamanism conveys a powerful message we are intimately connected with this world and all the life within it. In shamanism, rituals are not only a form of spiritual practice but also the core of community life. Each ritual acts as a bridge for the shaman to communicate with the spiritual world, aiming to bring healing, protection, and guidance to individuals and the community. Let's delve into several typical shamanic rituals to understand their meanings and roles within the community. First, we have healing rituals. In these rituals, shamans summon healing spirits through singing, dancing, and the use of sacred objects, such as drums and feathers. These spirits can help diagnose the root of ailments, whether physical, emotional, or spiritual. Healing rituals are not just about treating the patient's body, but also healing their soul, restoring harmony between the individual and the natural world. Next is the Soul Journey Ritual. In this practice, the shaman enters a deep trance state, their soul leaving the body to travel to the spiritual world to find and restore lost soul parts. This ritual is crucial for healing those who have suffered deep psychological traumas, helping them retrieve lost parts of themselves, restoring inner peace and wholeness. Animal sacrifice is another important ritual, reflecting shamanism's profound respect for the natural world. In this ritual, Shamans hold solemn ceremonies for the animals being sacrificed, thanking them for their sacrifice and ensuring their spirits return peacefully to nature. This is not only a praise of the life force of the natural world, but also a reminder to community members of the cycle of life and mutual dependence. Through these rituals, shamans not only establish connections with the spiritual world, but also strengthen the ties within the community. The holding of rituals brings community members together, experiencing spiritual cleansing and renewal collectively, enhancing understanding and support among each other. They teach us that regardless of the difficulties faced, the strength of the community and guidance from the spiritual world can always lead us to a solution. How does ancient shamanism find its place in modern society amidst rapid technological advancements and deepening globalization? This question leads us to explore the relationship between shamanism and the modern world, and how it adapts and impacts our era. With societal development, shamanism has not disappeared as many had anticipated. In some ways, 
it has even found new vitality in modern society. Today we see shamanism not only being practiced in its traditional heartlands, such as Siberia, South and North America, but its influence has also spread globally, especially within Western societies. In recent years, the Western world's interest in shamanism has significantly increased. The reasons behind this trend are complex and diverse. On one hand, people's desire for spiritual seeking and personal growth has grown, finding a path in shamanism to coexist harmoniously with nature and explore the inner world. On the other hand, as environmental issues intensify, shamanism's profound respect and understanding of the natural world offer a unique perspective, helping people reevaluate their relationship with the earth. This modern revival of shamanism is not only reflected in individual spiritual exploration, but also at the societal and cultural levels. Shaman workshops, healing rituals, and spiritual journeys are becoming increasingly popular globally, attracting people from various backgrounds and beliefs, seeking the healing and wisdom offered by shamanism. However, this increased interest also brings challenges and controversies. Some critics worry that the Western fascination with shamanism might lead to cultural appropriation and misunderstandings of shamanic traditions. Thus, how to benefit from shamanism's wisdom while respecting and protecting these ancient traditions becomes a thought-provoking issue. Despite challenges, the survival and development of shamanism in modern society prove its resilience and relevance to the era. It reminds us that even in this highly digitalized and technologically advanced age, ancient wisdom and a profound understanding of the natural world still hold irreplaceable value. In the world of shamanism, everyone's journey is unique. Let's delve into the stories of modern shamans or individuals practicing shamanic rituals, seeing how they integrate this ancient spiritual practice into their lives and what this process means to them. First, meet Elena, a woman living in the modern city who found inner peace and purpose in life through shamanic practices. Elena was a busy professional until a shamanic workshop she attended on a whim completely changed her life. In the workshop, she learned how to enter trance states through drumming, conversing with her inner spiritual guides. This experience empowered her with a strong inner force, helping her face stress and challenges in her daily life. Elena set up a small altar at home, where she performs short rituals every morning, lighting incense, drumming her shamanic drum, and immersing herself in deep meditation. This has become the most precious moment of her day, an opportunity to converse with herself and recharge. For Elena, shamanism is not just a spiritual practice, but a way of life, teaching her how to live in harmony with the surrounding world. Next, we turn to Michael's story. Michael is an environmental activist who encountered a shaman during a trip, an experience that gave him a new understanding of the natural world. Michael began to delve into shamanic teachings, especially its respect and protection for nature. He learned how to express gratitude to Mother Earth through rituals, making his environmental work more meaningful. Before participating in activities like cleaning rivers or planting trees, Michael performs a simple ritual, seeking help and thanking the spirits of nature. He believes these activities are not only about healing the wounds of the natural world, but also about repairing the connection between humans and nature. For Michael, practicing shamanism is a mission, a motivation to work for the protection of our shared home, Earth. As our journey nears its end, let us reflect on the profound insights shamanism brings to modern people. In this fast-paced, technology-driven era, shamanism reminds us to return to the basics, rebuild our connection with nature, and discover the diversity and richness of life. Shamanism is not just an ancient belief system. It is a mirror reflecting our deep connection with the world. It teaches us that every leaf, every drop of water, and even every gust of wind is filled with life and spirit. This profound understanding and respect for the natural world is not only environmental protection, but also an art of living, a way to make our lives richer and more meaningful. Through shamanic spiritual practices, we learn diverse ways to explore the secrets of the self and the universe. Whether through rituals, 
meditation, or direct interaction with the natural world, shamanism provides a path to the inner depths, finding peace and balance amid the hustle and bustle. Ultimately, shamanism tells us that true wisdom and power come from our profound understanding and respect for the world. In today's world, filled with challenges and opportunities, the teachings of shamanism are more important than ever. It encourages us to embrace diversity, respect nature, and find our true selves through spiritual exploration. Let us continue our journey with shamanism, with open hearts and respectful attitudes, discovering the essence of life and creating a more harmonious, sustainable world.